August the 19th, 2021, <coughs> scheduled monthly board meeting. Yes, we're good. All right, Mr. Prager. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day to May. We pray to keep all of our students safe and out of harm's way. We pray to remove this coronavirus from all of our uh, county, our state, our country. We pray that we be good spirits over everything we're in charge of tonight. Let us make good decisions. And we ask your blessing down upon this meeting. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Ohio County Schools provide students with the skills, knowledge, and support to achieve excellence and become lifelong learners. All right, you have your agenda in front of you. I need a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Or the agenda, I'm sorry. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. We have no recognition for the presentation. Not this month, no sir. All right. Now, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> I'll second that. All right, we have a second. All in favor? <coughs> motion carried. All right, we have a pretty lengthy personnel report for your review. Yeah, you can see it's still really long, uh, busy down the home stretch, filling on for positions uh, that you have that report in front of you for review. We have a data security breach and location. Uh... Yes, that best practices guide, that's something that you have to re review each August, I'm just going over our data security and uh, the breach notification. KDE requires you to do that each and every August. There's no action needed but you just have to review it each August. So that was included in your packets for your review. Right. Treasurer's report. You should already received your, uh, your, in your packet all the treasurer information. I'll just draw your attention to the form that we usually look at uh, that shows last year and then this year and the change. In looking at the amounts, I'll also call your attention to where it says seek allotment. If you notice, uh, the seek allotment from the state this year for this time was about $47,000 more than last year. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is for this one year only, or at least right now, we're actually getting funded for full day kindergarten. Historically, we've only been funded for half of kindergarten. So if you have 300 kindergarten students, the state only funds you for 150 of them. For this year, uh, in order to pass one bill, I guess uh, the caveat for them to get enough yeses to pass it was they were fully funding kindergarten. So that's why this past uh, SEEK installment you saw an additional $47,000. Everything else was uh, just as planned, the, the revenues and expenditures. And you can see that we still have a very positive cash flow and that there was a substantial change in the bank from last year to this year and that has to do with our bond proceeds. You know, with all the construction projects we have going on, all that money is in our bank account. And then as those projects are getting closer to completion, we'll be starting to write pretty large checks that we'll be paying these contractors as they finish these projects. What's the timeline on what? September 6th. That concludes the treasurer's report, Mr. Chairman. I need a motion and a second for the treasurer's report. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Any more questions? All in favor? Motion carried. All right. Approved the FY 2022 uh, <coughs> SBM allocations. In fact, your site-based allocations, as you know the procedure, uh, we went over the preliminary and then we did the end of the year on which we based all of our staffing decisions for the summer. Well, as our board policy requires, once school starts, we look at actual numbers and then revisit staffing policy to make sure that we're not understaffed anywhere or to see if we're overstaffed anywhere. In the report that you received, you will see that right now, uh, we do have two schools that have an extra teacher, if you will. Uh, their numbers are not exactly what their projections were, and that was at Beaver Dam and Horse Branch. 
but at this point in time, all of those individuals are already <coughs> contracted for the year. So you're certainly not gonna send anybody home. So my recommendation would be that those two teachers remain at each of those schools and that they just be overstaffed for the year. We'll call it a section seven request. The same for Fordsville, they were down one or half of a kindergarten assistant. Uh, again, that person is already there. I don't like the idea of moving them to another school. So we would, uh, I would like to ask that be a section seven request as well. But then you see that two schools enrollment was a little bit higher in kindergarten than what we projected. So Southern and Western both will gain a half of a kindergarten assistant. Uh, so once you approve this document tonight, those individuals, uh, well, those two schools respectively would be able to post a 0.5 job if they want to go after somebody or they can choose to take the money. And so we'll let each of those schools and our councils make that decision. So down two teachers and an assist, half an assistant, but my recommendation is that we let them stay and leave those alone and then grant Southern and Western each their 0.5 assistant that the numbers call that they should, should get. So it be my recommendation, Mr. Chairman, that you would approve the site-based council final allocation as presented this evening. All right, we have a recommendation from the superintendent. I need a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. I'll second. This was something that I've talked with you via text about. Uh, this was kind of a more late addition, if you will, to the agenda. So sorry for kind of the late notice. But last year, in dealing with this pandemic with COVID, the state granted us basically an unlimited number of leave days that staff could have access to should they test positive or be quarantined or have a family member that's quarantined. This year, those days don't exist, but I feel like we need to do at least something to help our staff. Uh, so by law, by KRS 161.152, uh, each local board of education can give their employees Three, up to three emergency days. Right now, we don't use emergency days in Ohio County Schools. It'd be my recommendation that we pass this resolution so that every employee has three emergency days that can be used for COVID-related things, whether it's themselves or a family member or staying home with a sick child. That way, there's at least three days pay that they can receive and, and not have to take that hit. Uh, and again, Three days is all we're allowed by law right now to give, or I per perhaps would be asking for more. But it'd be my recommendation that we'd approve this resolution so that I can get this out to staff and that they would know there's at least three days that they can use in, if one of those situations arise for their family. All right, we have a recommendation and a resolution from the superintendent. I need a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The first person on the list is Ben Everly. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Superintendent, for allowing me to speak, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to take a, a quick minute here and, and introduce uh, a group of us that are, that are present tonight. Uh, we have uh, some football alumni, we have friends, we have uh, players that uh, played with Coach Riley, uh, and we have some coaches that have uh, said some things that we would like to uh, to express. Uh, we're going to have Del Carwell come up and speak, and, and what we're asking for is uh, give us a few minutes to talk about Coach Bruce Riley and the opportunity to uh, take the field at Frank Barnes Stadium and name it in honor of Bruce Riley. <coughs> Hey everybody, I'm Dale Cardwell from Centertown. I married up, her name was Angie Saint from Beaverdam. Uh, we have two kids, we live in Atlanta, and I'm privileged to own a company called Investigative Consumer Solutions, which gives me the opportunity to create a television show 
that airs all over the country called Inside Investigations. I tell you that because what we do on the show is we help people that have lost hope. We, we help and save consumers who think that there's nowhere to turn. And I tell you that because I'm going to take you back 40 years. 40 years ago, I was a scrawny, no talent kid from Centertown who had a lot of ambition and a lot of dreams. And what I've learned through the years, and Jeff and Steve and Ben and Peabody will tell you, is that coaches generally gravitate toward the talent. That's how they win. They identify the kids that have the talent, and they push the kids that have the talent, and they feature the kids that have the talent. Coach Rayleigh discovered me way back in 1978, 1979, because I had no talent, but what I had was a need. And what I found is I was surrounded by kids from O'Layton or from Rosine or from Fordsville or from Centertown that, that had a need. And the need was to be nurtured and to be seen and to be recognized and to promote it. And so I found this while I was researching this subject, and I thought it really spoke well to who Coach Rayleigh is. One of the most important kids you will ever coach is the one who needs the program more than the program needs him or her. I think, guys, that, that speaks to Coach Riley more than anything I can say. So there are fields and stadiums all over the Commonwealth and all over the Southeast and all over the country that feature great athletic accomplishments, um, state championships, leading rushers. Uh, what I'm going to ask of you guys tonight and our, my fellow teammates uh, are going to ask of you is let's recognize a guy that built character off the field. Let's recognize a guy that found the kid that needed him instead of the kid that was going to be successful in the program. Uh, so a few years ago, I was, I was honored by the school that you may or may not know to put my name on the Wall of Fame. I'm here to tell you tonight that I would not be on that wall if Coach Rayleigh had not coached me on that field. Um, and that's how, that's how strongly we feel about it. And so we really, really appreciate, appreciate your, your listening to us and giving us this opportunity to present ourselves. So Thank this you. is my pleasure. This is a formal request. Okay. If you guys can indulge me you. for 60 more seconds, I'm going yeah, to read what you said. I'll give it to you as soon as I read it. Okay. Let her take mine. Dear members of the Ohio County Board of Education, please accept this letter as a formal request of the undersigned as we respectfully ask you to name the Ohio County High School football field at Frank Barnes Memorial Stadium in honor of Coach Bruce Rayleigh. We are making this request not only based on Ohio County native Bruce Rayleigh's <coughs> contributions to the athletic program, but most importantly to the guidance, encouragement, and mentorship Coach Rayleigh provided to hundreds of student athletes during his coaching tenure and continuing today. As his coach, Dick Berry, so eloquently stated, Bruce is a true Ohio County. He grew up in Horse Branch, Rosine community. He has had other jobs, but has always lived in the county. This honor will incur no expense to the county or taxpayers, but will serve as a permanent display of our gratitude for a life of service. We respectfully request your action in time to honor Coach Riley at an upcoming home game this 2021 season. Coach Rayleigh's resume and contributions to the countless student athletes are attached to this letter. Sincerely, Jeff Black, Shane Kennedy, Randy Rock, Jimmy Wilson, Jay Kirk, Ben Everly, Dick Berry, Jason Anderson, David Morris, Kevin Bennett, Bo Bennett, Carl Calloway, Mike Bosick, Mark Solo, Greg Lutrell, Larry Griffin, Tim Greer, Todd Render, Barry Tishner, Dalton Maples, Sherry Rayleigh Wade, Josh Ashby, Rick Drake, John Smith, John Danks, Brad Atney, Scott Lewis, Jerry Wright, Roger Rushing, Andy Miller, Dale Cardwell, and many, many others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Jerry Hoskins. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the school board and all the bad guys <laughs> sitting in the back. <laughs> Lady being honored in this way. Uh, I've, I don't, I've not had a lot of experiences with him except other than in circuit court where he was the foreman of the jury that closed the road to my farm. And what he did, 
there was supposed to have been eight people on that jury to vote to close my road. And there was only seven. And he, he turned he, he turned into Ronnie Dortz, the judge, that there was eight. Well, that night, so I so I lost the case, so they closed my road. I spent ten thousand dollars trying to keep my road open to my farm. Well, that night one of the jurors called me and she also called Judge Dorch and said there was not eight people that wanted to close that road. There was only seven. I did not vote to close your road. So I think to honor an educator that can't count to eight, I'm not in for that. So I'm, I'm, I don't think it should be done and I just want to express my opinion. And, that, and a lot of other people may have had better experiences with Bruce Ray. But now that's my one and only experience with him. I've heard other rumors. I'm not even going to mention those. But now I'm against it. And that's all I got to say. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Children need 
obviously there's vaccines that the, you know you do have to have for the school system. So if that becomes one that the school is required to have, is there anything in place um, for that? Um, I think that's it. I think I've covered everything, um, hopefully. So thank you for giving me the time um, to talk. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, how's that work? Her questions get answered later? Usually, we just allow people to speak and there, there's not really a Q&A section, but I don't care to address some things here in a little bit when I get to, okay. get to do my speaking part. So, uh, we do know that there is religious exemption for vaccines at the school. We all wear that, right? So... And there's a multitude of those that are there, the hepatitis, diphtheria, tetanus, pertinitis, they go on and on and on. So you can claim that. And then it's essentially authority as a school board is if you come up positive with that or if there's a the case in there, they can send you home for three weeks if that's it. Let's see, what is this right here? This is KRS. Look at all these KRSs confused anyway. I do not so I can share that with everybody if they would like to see that. So I just got a couple of questions. She really had the biggest questions that I have as far as the funding, how the funding works, how the liability works. Um, that was really my biggest thing. There is an injunction that's been passed now that is going to hold the governor uh, responsible to HB1. Have, is that on the agenda to how that's going to be addressed? At a later date, it may be. It's not on the agenda tonight, no, sir. So the, so the Kentucky Board of Education has authority over you guys? That is correct. And that's through funding? That's through funding and also licensure. Licensure. Like everyone's certificate, mine, teachers, anybody's. It all funnels through the Department of Education. So you're saying if you were to uh, make a decision to, to leave it at parents' choice, they could take away your license to be a superintendent? They it's could been take implied, yes. Yes, 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 ma'am. I have a question right here, okay, with that being applied, okay, why is it when I wrote an email to the state board, they told me to come here to y'all to address the mask okay. mandate? They dismissed me by telling me to come to y'all. All right, let me, let me try to answer some questions and maybe sure. that'll help, okay? Yeah, I know, um, I know we're putting you on the spot. Yeah, but and I usually mean, we just listen to you. you have to understand. That's right. <clears throat> You become the front man here. Sure. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah. As you know, this whole process began. Our local district, we were making masks optional. Sure. Yep. We were leaving it up to the parent and the individual to make a choice. That got taken away from us by the governor by signing his executive order, which his executive order lasts for 30 days. That's what his authority has right now. Now, there's some questions and there's an injunction made, but it's all still waiting to be heard. So until it's heard, his authority is still valid until it's actually heard in court. But then there's still a lot of questions and HB1 is one of those questions. I will say that right now, HB1 does say that you should follow the CDC's recommendation or the executive legislations, maybe, I don't have it in front of me, whichever is, uh, least restrictive, which right now the CDC recommends that universal masking for all schools, uh, K through 12, ages two and up. But then what really hit us, probably even more so than what the governor did, since there was a lot of uh, legal issues with that, was the State Board of Education making the vote that they did. They do have authority over all school districts and over all boards. And, and when, at their meeting, I watched it live and one of the things that was said, well, what happens if they don't comply? And basically the answer was, and I'm paraphrasing, but the answer from the commissioner was, well, we hold all their funding. And when you ask, what does that mean? It's not a little funding, that SEEK formula. SEEK is the majority of our budget. That's what drives it. So if we don't get our funding, then we can't make payroll. <laughs> we can't do things like that and, and keep our staff employed. Uh, now this is state funding. Yes. 
state funding. Or through our property taxes. You got it. Okay. You got it. All right. But the bottom line, the state board of education has authority over the local board. Mm -hmm. And their statute and authority that backs that up. So when they made their ruling, that's when it tied everybody's hands. There were some other districts, and some of you sent me emails. I think it was Marshall County that at first said, we're going to stand against what the governor said. Well, once the state board made their ruling, I talked to that superintendent down there. Unfortunately, they had to change their stance and comply because now they, they have no option. They have to comply. So on your um, em employees that are exposed, that are not vaccinated, not being paid, that little game we're playing there, has that come through the state board or does that come through this board? The, the resolution we passed tonight? No, uh, as I understand it, if, if you have an employee that's not vaccinated and they have an exposure, they fall into a tier system on how they're going to be using their pay to get yeah. their pay. Who, who made that decision? The state as well. State as well. And right now, they were told to well, use you sick days. State, you mean the, the Board of Education? Yes, KDE, Department of Education. Okay. okay. Now, what we did tonight was that resolution that basically gives three extra days that one can that use. Helps. Since last year it was unlimited, this year nothing, so we wanted to do something to help a little bit. Right. Um, your, your question about the vaccine, you are correct. There is a religious exemption for all those vaccinations that one can turn in uh, when we have to gather those papers at the beginning of each year, and that would be under that category. Should they say this vaccine is required, there would be religious exemptions. Yeah. Yeah, so through all of this conundrum, I think it is fair to say that there are some of us that oppose the vaccine through religious beliefs, some of us through political beliefs, and then there are some of us that have true health concerns. And I don't think anybody in this room falls into that category, but generally, I think if we look at the governor's office and even larger, larger throughout our, our republic now, there is a belief, there's not even a consideration for these people. Uh, can, you, can you imagine if it was to, to, to be held that if you had a teacher that had been here 21 years and had a medical condition that could not get that vaccine and now they're terminated? I mean, I work through a subsidiary healthcare system. I make toilet paper. It's a great achievement. But anyway, um, I'm quite certain Kimberly Clark will, will follow lockstep with the rest of the healthcare world. And that's a, I'll just end it with, that's a, that's a, that's a bad sign. All right, sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I know I wasn't, I'm not on the list to talk to because I got here late, but have y'all realized how dirty these children's masks are at the end of the day? How nasty they are on the inside? This is what they're breathing all day long. Is that staff start in your nose at a dark, wet place. It doesn't have to come up on your face. It can come up on your hind end or wherever or even get in your lungs. It can be deadly. This is bacteria on this mask, and you can clearly see it. This is what my daughter wore home. She's nine from today. April Peach. Amen. We want to thank you. We do. Um, and we're right here with you, and um, we're behind you. Um, we hate it that your hands are tied too. Um, but just in case we forget, um, my son, as of yesterday, I didn't want to cry, comes home and is trying to figure out some way that he can get out of school faster. He's a junior, and he's a great kid, and he's got a great family and a lot of support. And he is already disgusted and aggravated in one week of what the environment is that none of us, I believe, none of us think is okay. 
all of us know that the environment that this creates is unacceptable and not okay. But um, we're seeing it firsthand. I didn't, he did okay last year. My kids hunkered down and they pushed <coughs> through it. When they thought they had to do it again this year, they were like, no, we're not doing it. I can't do it, Mom. I'm not one of those parents that feeds this stuff into them and tells them what they want and what I want them to say. And I don't baby them and I don't coddle them and I don't, you know, like, feed into these negative thoughts. But it's real. What they dealt with last year, and I think all teachers, if there's any teachers in here, would understand that too, is no one talked. No one communicated. These kids sat there not even communicating or talking with their friends, not even with their best friends. They had a year of silence that was miserable. And they didn't want to go back into that this year. We didn't expect it to happen. It hit us all blindsided, every single one of us. Um, and when it happened, that I never even said it. I didn't even tell them it was coming. And they're like, Mom, we're not going. Mom, we don't want to do it. I don't want to go in there and mask up. I don't want to be there. So that reflected on what they went through last year. And they hunkered down and they went through last year perfect. They never complained. And I, I honored them because, Lord, I complained. You know? And they never said one word. And, but they knew they didn't want to do it again this year. And so he's, my first kid, my, my youngest, um, has already been in quarantine because of the soccer team. Um, that's on a whole different subject. He's dyslexic and needs to be in school. That's a whole different topic. All of this creates a downward spiral for every kid and for the teachers. So a kid with dyslexia, if they're pushed in quarantine, they struggle trying to get ahead when they get back into school a week later. They, they're playing catch up and they can't catch up. I don't know if you have a kid that struggles, but that's what happens. They can't catch up. So we had to make sure that they had the accommodations from the IEP to stay above water. We got paid for form already and people were totally complying with that. And it's doable, right? But it's not, not okay that this is what's going on. So um, back to Jaden um, is a junior. And he's literally like, came home the beginning of the week saying, can I just figure out how I can do co-op? And I don't even know if co-op's available for juniors. But he wants it. Like, he's just trying to figure out, in his head, he's not even sharing with me all of his thoughts. He's not even telling me everything he's going through. But he's like, I just want to just get what I gotta get done and get out of there. And I'm like, okay. And I kinda brushed it off. And I, he came home the next day, said it again, and I'm like, okay, brush it off. And he comes home yesterday, he said, Mom, it's depressing. Not a single person talks to anybody. It's depressing. I don't want to be there. And what do I do as a mom? I was like, God, you know, they're going. We're going. We want to be there. We're behind you all. We want to be there. But this is what we're receiving on the end, and my kid has a strong basis. My kid has a good family. What about all the kids that already struggle mentally, already struggle from their home life, do not have a good foundation, and now they're being pushed into an environment that none of us agree with? Um, and what's going to happen to them? What does that do to them? Those are the things that I think we need to think about and needs to rally behind us to figure out if we can do HB1 or whatever it's called. If we can get behind anything and figure out how we can free our kids of this and make it a choice because of their mental stability, the kids who don't have opportunities, who are already struggling mentally because they don't have stable homes and, and have to go into an environment that is a struggle and is depressing, no matter how strong you are. Um, I would think that any teacher would, and would say that, that it, whether or not, and I think we can all agree to it, whether, we're adults so we know how to push through that. But when you put that over your face, it, it reacts in your brain as a natural silencer. And you don't have the willpower to just be open-minded and talk and be, you know, personable and smile and relate to people because it silences all of that from within from, it's not even intentional, it's unintentional because that's what, when we cover 
cover our mouths, our brain wants to do. It wants to just kind of stop, and we have to push through that, and we know that as adults, but seeing those kids that didn't talk, they didn't know what was happening to them. They didn't know why they're not, nobody's talking. The teachers, you know, it took them many, many months to figure out why these kids aren't relating and talking back and engaging in a classroom. Why aren't they engaging? Well, because there's something over their mouth and their brain saying, just sit here and be quiet, right? So, amen, all of that aside, you know, that's what we're facing. That's what I'm sure we all know is happening. I'm sure that it's not just my kid that is expressing this. And I did not expect for him to come home and act like this because they hung for through and they did it last year, no problem. But I'm, I'm what, a weekend, and he is bound and determined. He's not even doing cross country, and he's a good runner. He don't want to do it. He doesn't, he don't want to put a mask on. He don't want to go to practice and put a mask on. He don't want to have to put a mask on at the end of the race of running a 5K when you're exhausted and put another mask on. He's like, I'm done with it all, Mom. I'm done with it. So it's discouraging him from the things that make him successful over these actions. And it's not your fault. I'm just showing the reality of what this is causing. And it's a trickle down effect. So all of that aside, um, one question that uh, we have, one more that didn't get hit, um, is, is the local board able to offer any type of support um, or compromise or alternative solution to mask breaks or outdoor classes to the parents um, concerned about the unlateral authorization um, by the KDE, KDE or KDE of the mask mandates. You know, is there anything that can be done um, to counteract that? Like a mask break, outdoor classes, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, time that, you know, I think last year that they even, um, they had to be super intentional over the intercom and create fun activities to get them to engage with each other and get them to engage. I know that was happening at the high school. I don't know if it happened everywhere. But they noticed it was an issue and they, uh, months and months and months into it and then addressed it and started implementing some things. But a mass break, outdoor classroom, something to get them some freedom from this and engage in this positive atmosphere, positive <coughs> engagement, and positive um, release of making school enjoyable instead of being a depressing place is what my kid said yesterday. And I wouldn't, and he loves school, he loves friends, he's a social butterfly. Um, but it's disheartening to see the discouragement. So, that's it. I don't know where I'm supposed to sign to speak. I, I got here a little late. And, um, I had no other plan. silencing that and I know it is not you guys but you are our voice use it you are our voice because that's what your power is sitting right there and we're expecting that of you guys 
regardless of how you feel, you, regardless of what your opinion is about masks, you're still our voice. And we expect you to voice for us. Because these little kids that are in speech and their parents are shelling out that money for speech, you're silencing that, setting them back. And I, I hear it. They contact me about it. Being in and out, in and out, in and out of school. Autism especially, but all of these special needs. But any typical kid needs routine. But you take a child with autism, Down syndrome, all of them, routine is their life. It's their, it's our life. And last year was miserable. And I frankly don't want to do it again. And we shouldn't have to. We, this is our freedom. Someone has, people have to start standing up. And our kids won't know how to stand up. If we don't, and you guys have been put in the power where you are to listen to your people in your area and then stand up for us. And I understand funding, and I understand all that. I've been with, I have been connected with the state myself for many years. But I have stood in Frankfurt myself, and I have bumped up against the people, and I understand the consequences. But sometime or another, you have to make a big decision, or you won't have one. And that's all I have to say. <coughs> As you can gather, I had planned to speak. Uh, I came to support you all. I learned something. I didn't know that you were more or less, in my opinion, being extorted by the state school board. Um, if you research the state school board, um, it's not actually indicative of what the state feelings are. Um, I followed the state legislature. Um, I've worked with a lot of them. I've been a uh, legislative liaison. I spoke with the legislators. There is HB1, and it, along with four other laws that they passed, and it's tied up in Kentucky Supreme Court, okay? It's being litigated. That's where we're being hamstrung. What you all need to do, more than just uh, approach these people, is get a hold of those, state, those legislators. There's seven of them, and you need to get a hold of them in their own district and let your voice know, get this out of litigation. Either make a decision, our state legislators, just like you folks, that we elect to represent us, have passed these laws. They do not go along with what the governor or the school board, state school board, excuse me, is doing. And they are very frustrated. They can't call themselves back into special session. All of, there, there's five of the very, very important laws. I'm sure you all have heard of them. I don't think maybe a lot of you have heard about them. But when you get it tied up in the courts, that's not who we elected to make our laws. We're not judges or judici you know, the judicial system. The state legislators, our local school board, are the people that we elect to represent us and make decisions. Because you can make decisions locally that will impact us and be best for our interest. So if you all, I feel sorry for you. I feel you're, you are being extorted. I've got teachers in my family. Uh, you know, when you've got, you know, 25 years in and you're looking towards retirement, you know, that's, to me, actually, our government, our state government is extorting you. Not the whole government, but, you know. So our legislatures, you all look into it. Research what the state legislators have done. We have a supermajority of conservative people in the House and in the State Senate, and they want to rein the governor in. I've spoken to a lot of them. So if at all you can have any impact to reach out to those justices and to your state legislators and let them know, quit tying this up in court. Our lives are too important. We're losing a whole generation of kids. I've worked in Davis County public schools. I've worked at their school board. 
Um, I've worked in the cafeteria. I've worked as an assistant. I love kids. And what we're doing to the kids, I think you all understand too, is very detrimental. And I, like I said, I was supremely surprised to find out that uh, they're holding this carrot over y'all's head too. You know, Kentucky should not be a welfare state. We should not be following that carrot for everything. I've talked to a lot of people. We'd be willing to pay a few more dollars on our taxes and keep that money here. That's another fallacy. All the money doesn't have to go to them. We can find ways to keep money here and use the money here. I know that their biggest thing was um, at one point they would uh, send a taxi to go pick up kids to come to school because they wanted the money. They really didn't care if the kids were there, but they liked the attendance, you know. And I can completely understand that y'all's budget. You can't do anything for these kids if you don't have the money. <coughs> but at the same time, if you're creating a whole generation of kids that are being told that, oh, if you don't get the vaccine, you're going to kill somebody. That's really bad. So I just wanted to emphasize that I can understand your all's hands are tied to some extent. But if the rest of us can speak out and get this out of the court, because the state legislators have written laws that will stop this. We do not have a dictator. I'm sorry, Governor Bashir is not my dictator. I elected several local people to represent my issues. So thank you very much for letting me get impassioned because I care about kids. And I want you all to understand that you do have the power. I didn't realize that they were doing what they're doing to you all. But, you know, if we all pull together and find a way to voice our opinions. Well, I've got one more question. Thanks. Or it's not really a question. Thank you. Elijah, if you don't care, put that mask on your face. For just a second. Well, well, you know, just like the school committee. Okay, on the first day of school, my daughter had a new teacher. One that she never had before. The teacher hadn't really seen her. Now, can you tell me, actually, what from? If somebody was to come and take my child off the playground, which does happen, doesn't happen a lot, but can you tell me the markings on her face that will identify her? To tell the police if somebody comes and takes her. Can you tell me a marking? She's got full freckles. My other one has a beauty mark. This is covered. You can't identify them. You can't tell if one's got braces, snaggle tooth. It's covered. That's a very, very important thing for our teachers to know that what their children look like full faced. And they don't know. Take it off. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to make that point because that is. Very crucial to our teachers that our teachers and our staff know what our children look like. And right now they can't tell. People in Callaway. Everybody are doing? Good. I'm not here about no mask. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm here about Coach Ray. Now, my experience with Coach, I came down here the first time from Buffalo, New York, in grade school. That's how I met a lot of my family, you know. And then my father died. He was murdered in 84. I went back home, seventh grade. I got home. I didn't want to stay. I wanted to come back. You know, mom, all them could stay. I could come back and live with my uncle. My aunt. They already said I could. Just didn't have the money to come home. Got a hold of Coach Ray, sent me the money, and I came back to Beaverdale. Just to kind of show you the generous that he has. Because when I got back down here, I really, my uncle and them, they live on disability, so they really couldn't do too much. He bought my cleats. I paid for my camp at Dawson Springs, 4-H camp. 
He did a lot of things for a lot of us. A lot of us. He took us up under his wing. He didn't have to do that to me. You know, I'm just a black kid. He didn't have to do that, but he did. Shocked the heck out of me, but he did. And it really shocked me when I was in the hallway down by going towards the ad back hall after school I was so upset. Because I was hearing we had the meeting, but I was hearing all the other football players talk about they they let them in that. I couldn't afford it. Coach went. Got his stuff, gave me his varsity letterman jacket, gave it to him. Not to borrow, gave it to him. It was mine. Coach put a lot, a lot of discipline and everything in me. Because that seventh grade year in New York, playing football up there, yeah, it was all right. But it was not like playing down here. And I had some. I had some problem, attitude problems when I came back from New York. But Coach Ray, Coach Grant, because he was my middle school coach, you know, they got together. They both really took me up under their wings, and then when I went to high school, I was up under Coach. And I'm telling you now, if it wasn't for Coach, I wouldn't have made it through high school. If it wasn't for Coach, I wouldn't have played semi-pro football. Got to travel, got to make money. If it wasn't for Coach, he told me I could do it. Told me I had to be poor all my life. But thank God he was right. So you gotta understand, you know, there might be somebody that got a problem with him. But that's one problem. When he done coached all them years and had hundreds of kids and helped them all. For just for one problem, don't take something away that he deserved. Because he helped all of us. Because like we said this morning on the on the talk show. When you think about Ohio County football, you think about Coach Ray. It's just a simple fact. He's a part of it. And he still is. He's still out there. Not coaching, but he's out there. I mean, we got to step up. Frank Barn Memorial is always going to be Frank Barn Memorial. But the field should be an honor of Coach Bruce Ray. If you haven't played under him or him coach you, you might not understand where I'm coming from. Because we were like a family. The whole team. You know. But all I'm saying is that we need to do this in his honor. Not just because I adore him at a level. Some people don't. It is what it is. But he helped hundreds of kids. Like Dale said, that was lost and came, like me. But after my father was murdered, I was off the rails. I didn't care what you said, you said, you said, you said, because I would tell you. But when I got back down here, and got up under them, it changed my mind. You know? So all I want y'all to do, deep down, Take consideration. Think about it. <coughs> Just don't go on one negative thing or somebody says rumors and this and that. Rumors are rumors. That's why they call rumors. There's not really truth to it, there's not really false to it. It's just a rumor. So just don't let a couple of negative things interfere what needs to be done. That's all I got to say. Okay, Thank you. <laughs> no more requests to speak. Or we would say. Uh, just a couple things. Obviously, uh, we, we addressed some of the questions a while ago, but obviously this school year didn't start. Uh, the way we were expecting it to. You know, things were changed, unfortunately, at the last minute there at the ninth hour. And then that only got even more solidified, unfortunately, when the State Board of Education took the stance that they did. Um, but under the circumstances, you know, I will report to you that everyone's working hard. Uh, the staff are doing what they, the best they can. 
our students. Uh, I know they may not like wearing the mask. I've got two at home that I can tell you that don't like wearing the mask, but they're doing it. They're doing whatever they have to do to make sure we can be in school. Uh, they want to be there to see their friends and, and try to have as normal experience as they can, although uh, it certainly didn't start the way we wanted it to. Um, the projects, we've got three underway. I'll just give you a quick, quick update on each of them. Waylon, Mr. Evans, you asked about it earlier. September the 6th is the date that it's supposed to be complete. Uh, the preschool was talking about possibly waiting until the end of the nine weeks before moving. That way the room's completely set up. Uh, so September the 6th, the building will be complete. The pre preschool playground will not be complete. They're still doing some work on it, waiting for the equipment to arrive. The auxiliary building, uh, you know, it's supposed to be here, here in October. Now the latest date is September 2nd is when the building should arrive and you're looking at a completion date of mid-March. Certainly not the October that we were originally told. Uh, ATC, we are using uh, parts of that building. It's not all the way functional at this point in time. We're still having to use temporary air. Uh, it's not as cool as we would like it to be. The cooling tower arrived today. They'll be in installing it tomorrow, but unfortunately there's some test and balance process they have to go through. So you're probably looking at about two weeks before it's completely ready to go and they can flip the switch and that the air will be to where it needs to be. Um, they're still saying the overall completion of that with Render Center being moved over there that it should still be ready in January. I will tell you the shops we're not quite ready, all of them. Automotive, they're saying will now be ready on 8-24. Welding then on 8-26. Carpentry on 9-3. And then machine tool shop, they said will be up and functional on 9-10. Um, those shops before always had heat, but for air, all they used was fans or open the doors. They will have air conditioning once this is complete as well. So it'll be a better environment. Uh, new exhaust systems in the shops, a new dust collection si system in the carpentry shop. So certainly be a little bit better equipped than they were in the past, and that was the goal of this project, to upgrade the guts of that facility. I'll also tell you that Audubon, you know, we've received our three new school buses that we purchased. They came at the end of the school year. Audubon area, who we partner with for preschool, uh, gave us a new bus that came in uh, just a couple weeks ago. You know, we've been buying Thomas recently. It's an international, looks good. Everybody was, uh, I hate to use the word fighting for it, but everybody was certainly wanting it because it has air conditioning. And uh, it's very nice. They also just last week, we, we had three Audubon buses that we leased from them each year for a dollar a piece. They brought us a 2018 bus that had 10,000 miles and then took one that was 15 years old off our lot. So that was a good trade. So appreciate Audubon for helping us out a little bit in that capacity. All in all, again, certainly not the way we wanted school to start, but uh, we've had a good first official week of school now that we've been in for uh, a full week and we're certainly making the most of it. And that concludes my report to you at this time, Mr. Chairman. All right, we have a reason for court session. Yes, sir, we do. Possible right. litigation. I need a motion to go in closed session for KRS 61.810. I have a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Okay. Right. I'm in closed session.